Okay, so at the end of the at the end of the last lecture, uh, we were talking about uh, string functions. So one of the functions we were talking about was uh, str cat. So that's the function that concatenates the contents of src uh, onto the uh, end of the string pointed at by dest. Right. So concatenates the source onto the end of the destination string. What you have to remember with this function is that the destination string has to have sufficient capacity to hold itself plus whatever was in SRC. Oh, sorry. So if we've got this little program here called cat, right? I've got a string, it's got, sorry, I've got an array of car. It's got enough space to store a string of length of size 10, right? Because you need that extra one character for the null terminator. So if I try to concatenate the digits zero through nine onto the end of the string S, this should work okay. Right, so let's try that. Right, oh, and that seems to work all right. right. So I'm printing out here. So I'm gonna print out S. So I'm gonna concatenate five, six, seven, eight, nine onto the end of S. When I print S, I should get the numbers zero through nine. If everything's correct, when I print T, I, T is still five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, and that seems to be the case, right? So we, S is the string zero through nine, T is the string five through nine. Now, if you play around with that number there, you can make all sorts of weird things happen. So if I make a S an array of car of size six, it can hold the five, number, the five digits here plus the null terminator, Right, but when I concatenate five, six, seven, eight, nine onto the end of S, or sorry, what am I doing here? When I concatenate them onto the end of S, um, funny things happen. Okay, so recompile and run it again. Right now, S uh, is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Right, it's not seven, eight, nine. It's eight, eight, nine. Right, so that's weird. So it looks like the string concatenation has failed somehow. But what's even stranger is that T also changes. Right, T is now the string 6889. Uh, so what's happened here is that string cat has run off the end of the string S. Right, right. so when you concatenate T onto the end of S, right, it tries to write the five onto the end here. Right, so that, that actually works, right, because there is room to hold the sixth character here. Now when you write the six onto the end of that, that goes past the end of S, right? And so if you look at what happens here, it looks like the six ends up overwriting what's sitting in T, right? So the six you try to add here and it ends up overwriting the five that's here. And then it keeps on going and it ends up doing something strange, right? So string cat has not only failed to concatenate the strings correctly, it's actually overwritten some other value, right? And if you do things like introduce other variables into this program, uh, you can get all sorts of funny things to happen, right? So this is an example of what's called a buffer overflow error, uh, probably the most, one of the most common sources of security errors in C programs, right? When you use a function that uh, accidentally runs past the end or the beginning or somewhere random in memory um, of a buffer, right? So you have to be a little bit careful with uh, when you use the, uh, when you're using the string functions. Okay, so there's a function called strncat, which was introduced um, a long time ago now. That was supposed to be the quote unquote safe version of string cat, right? So in other words, it was supposed to let the programmer prevent these things from happening, um, but it does so in an unintuitive way, right? So strncat takes in another parameter. Where'd it go, cat n, okay. So strn cat takes in this parameter here, that's an int, right? And so what that parameter is, is that tells you how many, that tells strn cat how many copy, uh, how many characters it's supposed to copy from t onto s, right? So if you just look up the documentation for this, it'll tell you what that's supposed to do, right? So that number 10 is the number of characters to copy, unfortunately, um, it's very easy to misinterpret this function, right? And a lot of programmers think that 10 is not the number of characters to copy, but rather it's the, uh, do, 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 right? Instead, they want the 10 
to be the maximum length of S. Right? So in other words, make sure that S is no longer than 10 characters, which seems sensible. Right? If you want a secure function, right? if you want a function that prevents overwriting of another string, uh, running past the end of another string, you want to say how long that other string should be at most. That's not the way that this str and cat function was uh, created. Right? So that's the number of characters to copy, unfortunately, rather than the maximum length of the string s. So if you make a string, uh, if you make a buffer s, right, that can hold a string of length 10, right? if you try to append the string t onto the, um, onto the end of string s, you have to remember that that 10 will copy 10 characters from t and stick it onto the end of s. If there's not enough room in the array s, you've got a problem. So in this case, we have a problem, right? Because um, if I try to copy 10 characters from here onto here, you end up with a string of size 16 at the end, right? 15 characters plus the null terminator. Um, so if you run uh, cat n, right? Uh, so you can see what happens. So it looks like s has the right length. Uh, does it? Yes, so it does look like s has the right length. It looks like it's length 15. Right? But you can see that t has now been overwritten as well. Right? So t, which used to be 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, right? now prints as 1, 2, 3, 4. Right? So something's happened to the array t. Right? And again, it's because you've run past the end of the array s. Uh, the quote unquote truly safe version of SDR and cat is the one that's SDR and cat underscore s. So when you look around at the string.h header file for the documentation, you'll see all of these functions that look almost exactly the same, right? There's str cat, there's str n cat, there's str n cat underscore s. The reason is they all do something slightly different. This happens to be the one uh, that's the uh, secure version of str of string cat, right? Okay, if you want to compare two strings for equality, you cannot use equals equals or not equals. Right, so remember what strings are in C, right? They're just um, arrays of car. So in other words, if you use the name of the array, that's just a pointer. So if you use equals equals or not equals, that compares if two pointers point to the same object or point to different objects, right? That's not what you want for strings, right? For strings, you normally wanna check do two strings have the same sequence of characters. If you wanna check if two strings have the same sequence of characters, the function to use is str uh, comp CMP. Right? So use that function, equals equals zero, to determine if two strings are equal, not equals zero, to determine if they're not equal. If you're interested in whether a string comes before another string alphabetically, then the value returned by str comp can tell you that. Right? So the function takes in two pointers, right, to, uh, or two strings, right? and it compares those two strings uh, lexicographically, right? so in dictionary order. Uh, in other words, this behaves the same way as the string compare to method does in Java. Right? The sign of the result is the sign of the difference between the values of the first pair of characters. So what does that mean? It means if the string LHS comes before the string RHS in dictionary order, then the value of strmp uh, of string comp is negative. Right? If L LHS comes after RHS in the dictionary order, then the value of string comp is positive. Uh, so here's a little program that just compares two strings, and then it prints out whether or not they're equal. If whether or not s comes before, sorry, whether or not the first string one comes before string two, or whether or not string one comes after string two. Right? How does it work? You just get the result after calling um, string comp. Right? If the result is zero, the strings are equal. If the result is negative, the first string comes before the uh, second string, right? If the result is positive, the first string comes after the second string. Right? Uh, so more or less exactly the same as the way compare to works in Java. Uh, what's this program called? Compare. Right, so compare ABC to ABC and they should be equal. Right, compare X, y, ABC to XYZ and ABC should come before XYZ. Right, and if you flip them around, uh, then X, Y, Z should come after uh, A, B, C. Right. 
Oh. Uh. Okay. So there's more string comparison. There are more string functions that we need to talk about. Okay, so you can search strings as well. Uh, so str chr finds the first occurrence of a character, ch, inside of a string str. Right? Uh, so this actually returns the, it returns a pointer to the location of that character, uh, assuming that it exists in the string. Right? If it doesn't exist in the string, then it returns null. Uh, the int, right? so you might wonder why that's int instead of car, uh, and that's because of historical reasons. Uh, so this is one of the very str, oh wait, sorry, I've skipped there. Uh, that int there is for historical reasons. It's because uh, this is one of the first functions that appeared in the C standard library many, many, many years ago, right? And many, many, many years ago, it was common to use ints uh, to store car character values, right? Uh, and so they, can't, uh, they couldn't change the definition of the function without breaking a lot of code, so they just left it in. Um, this little example program we have, so where to go? Not that one, sorry. Where's my web browser? Uh, so here we go. Okay, so this little program, we have a string, right? So that's what, uh, this is Yoda. Try not, do or do not, there is no try, right? We're gonna look for the T, right? There's two T's, right? There's one here, there's a second one here. Um, we're going to look for, we're going to call strchr, right? We're going to look for the t in the string called result, pointed at by result, right? So we start by taking the pointer result and making that point uh, at the same string as str, right? Now this while loop's a little bit funny, the way it's written, right? So what it's going to do is it's going to take the result of calling strchr, Right? And it's going to store that pointer in the variable result. Right? Now, all of that's in brackets, so that's the first thing that happens. Right? Parentheses have highest, or, uh, have highest uh, precedence, uh, sorry, parentheses have highest precedence. Right? And so in this expression here, something equals something, the result of that expression is the thing on the left-hand side. Right? So in other words, if we find the character t somewhere in the string str, right, then result will point at that string. So in other words, the first time we run this loop, result's gonna point at that t, right? You now compare result to null, right? Well, result points into the string, so it's not null, right? So we'll print out the string starting at result, uh, and then we move result one character forward, right? Remember, result's a pointer. So when you add one to result, it moves it to the next character, right? So we'll find the T, then we move it to the R, right? And so now the string, the pointer result points at the string starting at the R, Y, right? Next time through the loop, we call strchr again, we find the T here, print out the rest of the string, right? And then advance results so that we start at the H, search the rest of the string starting at the H for the capital T. If you run the program, uh, you end up, oh, where you go? Uh, there we go. So found the T starting at try not, right? Run again, found the T starting at there is no try, right? This is kind of cool because you can actually modify this, right? So here's another T. Whoa, here's another T like that. Run it again. And it finds the T starting at the T. Uh, so this, the uh, documentation at this website is pretty good. The embedded examples are actually modifiable um, and you can run them. Uh, so this is pretty cool. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, if you want to find the last occurrence of a character, use strr chr. Now notice the other annoying thing about the C library. Right? The only difference in these two functions is that one letter R. Right? So it's extremely easy to make uh, errors when you're typing in the names of these functions. Right? You want to search the last character, use R inside, so it's strr, chr. I think that's because it's searching in reverse. 
right? So it's searching from the end of the string to the front of the string. Um, and it works exactly the same way, right? Uh, except defines the last occurrence of the character. Right, now both of these functions, they return a pointer to the character that's in the string that it found, right? Uh, often you don't care about the character, often you don't need the pointer, or sometimes you don't need the pointer, right? Instead, sometimes you want the index, right? But if you want the index, you just use pointer subtraction to get the index, right? So here, I'm gonna search for a character in a string. I'm gonna find, I'm gonna search for the first and last occurrence of a character in a string, right? So first and last. Right, uh, is that right? Yeah, I'm gonna search for the first and last. Uh, so I'm gonna use strchr to search the string str for the character c, right? I'm going to use strr chr to find the last character in the string c, right? If I find the character, I'm gonna compute the indexes of the two characters, right? So what's the index of the first character? It's just first minus str. Right, first is the pointer pointing at the character. Right, str is the pointer pointing to the front of the string. Subtract the two pointers, that gives you the index. Right, last is the pointer pointing at the last character in the string. Right, str is the pointer pointing to the front of the string. Subtract the two to get the index of the string. Um, what's the unusual thing here? I guess this is slightly unusual. Um, so the way you, uh, the program expects uh, two command line arguments, right? One is the string to search. The second one is the character to search for, right? The, however, the main fu uh, function takes in a pointer to an array of car, right? Sorry, uh, takes in an array of pointers to car, right? So it's an array of pointers to car, right? So if I want the character corresponding to the second command line argument, right? It's argv2, so that's the second command line argument, right? The character at the front of that string is, uh, character, is the character at index zero, right? So that's, what, that's, why, uh, that's why that looks like the way it does. Uh, and if you run that program, again, you get the expected result, right? So index of, I don't know, um, some string. Right, let's look for the S, right? So we should get zero and one, two, three, four, five, right? And we do, right? Uh, if there's, you search for a character that's not in the string, you should get nothing, right? Why do you get nothing? Because uh, if, if the character is not in the string, then first is null, right? And here we check if first is not null. Uh, it's a little bit unusual to actually get the index in a C program because if you get the pointer, that's essentially the same thing, right? If I get the pointer to the car, you can do anything with the pointer that you can do with an index, right? In other words, I can change the I can change the character in the string, right? Just by dereferencing the pointer and then changing the uh, value, right? So you don't have to use uh, indexing um, if you've got a pointer. And str str uh, searches a string for a substring. Right, so we're gonna search that string uh, for that substring. Right? And, and again, it returns a pointer uh, to the start of the substring if it finds the substring in the string. Uh, so this, this works exactly the same way as um, strchr. Right? Uh, where is, here we go. And do I, strch, here we go. All right, so this little program here, it's got a string, one, two, three. It's gonna look for the substring two, right? So it should find that there, right? It's gonna look for the substring uh, equal to the empty string, so that'll be interesting. It'll look for the substring equal to nine, and it'll look for the substring equal to n, right? Um, so let's see, what this, let's see what happens here when you run the program. Boom. Okay, so found the substring two in the string one, two, three at position four, which makes sense, right? Zero, one, two, three, four, right? Uh, did it find the empty string? Uh, apparently it does, so it finds it at the beginning of the string, right? And so, doo -doo -doo, uh, but, so why does it find the empty string? Uh, oh, here it is. 
if substring points to the empty string, then str is returned, right? So it returns the string, uh, it returns the string that was searched um, if the substring is empty. Right, does it find the nine? It does not find the nine, right? Does it find the n? Um, and it does, right? So it finds the n at position one uh, in the string. Okay, this one's a funny function. Uh, so this is the string tokenizing function. Uh, so this is the function that you can use um, if you have a string and that string represents a bunch of information that's separated with tokens. Right, so a token can be, any, uh, can be any string, actually. Often it's a character, but it can be any string. Right, so for example, in a comma delimited, uh, in a comma separated file, right, you've got a bunch of information, each piece of information is separated with a comma. Right, so you can use this function to split the, to search the string incrementally looking for the commas. Uh, so the description of the function says that it finds the next token in a null terminated string where the tokens are separated by any character in delim. Oh, so these are individual characters. So delim then is a string that defines the uh, delimiters, right? So the separating characters um, that you, uh, the separating characters in your file or in your string. It returns a pointer to the next token, or null, if the substring's not found. So I guess we should do an example here. So if you have the string that's like uh, A, B, C, right, and D, right, and your delimiter is the comma, right, then the, when you call this function the first time, it's going to return a pointer to the A. So that's your, so your A, your B, your C, your D, those are your tokens. The commas are your delimiters. Now this function's weird, okay? So it returns a pointer to the next token, or null if the substring's not found, right? If string's not null, right? so if that's not null, right? Then that's a typo. Uh, these are typos, sorry. That extra k shouldn't be there, right? And then string token assumes that this is the first time the function is being used to tokenize the string. So what on earth does that mean, right? So if that's not null, right, then this function is going to start at the front of that string str, right. If it is null, then the function continues from where it left off, right, so that's very strange. So this is a very strange function. So this is a function that has state, right, it actually remembers where it was the last time you called the function. It's very unusual, right. So the first time you call the function on that string there, right, you end up with a pointer to the A, right, because uh, the comma, the delimiter is, uh, is immediately after the A, right, so the first time you call it, you get the pointer there, the next time you call the function, you're not going to pass in str for the first argument, you're going to pass in null, and now it will start searching after the, after the delimiter, right, so it advances that pointer past the delimiter, and now searches the string for the next token. And it remembers where that pointer is between calls to the function. Right? So if it's not null, then, uh, oh, I, so you can tell, it's just all copy-paste errors. That's str okay. Right? Assumes that this is the first time the function is being used to tokenize the string. Right? So what does it do exactly? It searches for the first character that's not a delimiter. Right? So, Search that string for the first character that's not a delimiter, that's the A, right? Now, if it finds one, right, so if it finds a, for the first character, oh, sorry, if it finds one, then it searches for the first character that is a delimiter, right? So if it finds the A, it now keeps on going, right? And then it hits the comma, right? So in other words, it advances the pointer, right? And now we're pointing at the comma. So the comma is a delimiter, right? And so what does it do? It replaces that comma with slash zero. So it actually modifies the string that you're searching. Right? So that becomes slash zero now, right? Which is strange, but that's the way it works, right? So it modifies the string that's being searched, replaces the delimiters with slash zero, and then it returns. 
right? So when it returns, uh, it's going to return a pointer to that A. OK, so now, the next time, if you want to find the B, then the C, then the D, then you're going to call it again, right? So when you call it again the next time, though, you pass in null for the string to search over, right? So if str is null, then this continues from where it left off during the previous call, right? It searches for the first character that's not a delimiter, right? So it searches for the first character that's not a delimiter, so it's going to find the B, right? If it finds what, uh, sorry, if it finds a character that's not a delimiter, it keeps going and looks for a delimiter, right? So in other words, it advances and finds the second comma, right? So now it's here, right? And then it replaces that second comma with a slash zero, right? So it replaces that with slash zero, right? And returns a pointer to the B, right? So this function is destructive, right? It destroys the string that you're searching over. If you don't want to destroy the string that you're searching over, make a copy of the string and then search the copy. Right. Okay, so what does this mean? So because it destroys the string, right, you can't search a literal string. Right? So in other words, you cannot write strtok double quotes some string. Because, double quote, because string literals in C are not modifiable. Right? So in other words, you actually need a pointer to an array. Uh, to, so you actually need an array of, of car uh, to call this function. Right? So here's an example of using strtok. Right? So my delimiter is going to be the colon. Right? Do, do, do. So I want to find field one, field two, field three, and field four, right? So the way you do this is you call strtok, passing in the original string, right, and the delimiter character that you're searching for, right? You do this the first time to start strtok uh, on the string str, right? Ooh, sorry. Okay, now if you want to find all of the fields, you just write a loop, right? Now remember, this thing returns a pointer uh, to a character in this string as long as it finds a, uh, whenever it finds a delimiter followed by something else, right? So when it finds field four, the next time you call it, it's going to return null because there's no more uh, tokens in the string, right? So in other words, as long as this thing t is not null, right? I can do something with the pointer t, right? So I can, print out the, I can print out the string, for example, right? And then I can continue, right? What else does this thing do? Okay. When the, where is this loop? Well, okay. So after that loop's done, I'm actually going to print out the uh, original, con the contents of the array str, right? Now remember, the contents of the array str, there's going to be a bunch of slash zeros in it, right? So I can't just use, uh, I can't just use printf to print the string. Printf will only go to the first null terminator, right? So that's not going to work. So I have to loop over the string manually and print out the characters one at a time. Oh, okay, so this is, what is this? This is probably tokenize. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is tokenized. Okay. All right, so this is the first loop, right? Finds field one, finds field two, finds field three, finds field four, right? What did it do to the string? So remember, our string looks like colon, 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 field one, colon, colon, field two, colon, field three, right? So on and so forth. Um, so what did it end up doing the string? So the first three colons, it skips over, right? Remember, the, when you call it the first time, it's going to look for the character that's not a delimiter. So it skips over the first three, right? And finds the F, right? And then it keeps going until it finds the next 
uh, delimiter, which is here, right? It replaces the delimiter with slash zero or null, right? And then returns a pointer to the F, right? So that's why I'm able to print field one the first time. When you call it again from inside the loop, right, it starts where it left off, right? So it starts here, looks for the character that's not a delimiter, Right, so skips over that, finds the F, right, remembers where the F is, keeps going to find the next delimiter, which is here, and replaces that delimiter with null. Right? Now notice what this lets the function do. Right? So if that's null, or the null terminator, right, and that's the pointer that's returned by the function, then when you print the string starting at this pointer, you print up to here, and then you hit the null terminator. Right? That's why it's sticking the null terminator in every time. Right? So that it can give you the actual string uh, that corresponds to a token. Right? If it didn't put this null terminator in, uh, it would have to do something else to return the string. Actually, I don't think it could return the string um, otherwise. Right? So that's why it's inserting these null terminators every time. So one more time, next time you call the function, it continues from the next character. Right, looks for the first character that's not a delimiter, so we get the F. Right? Now it continues looking for a delimiter, so it finds one here, replaces it with null. Right? Then it returns the pointers uh, that points to that F. When you print that out as a string, it prints out field three, and then you hit the null terminator, so it thinks that's the end of the string. Right? And then uh, you keep on going uh, to get the uh, rest of the tokens. So it's a very unusual function. I think it's the only one. It's the only one that I know of in the C library that works this way. Right? It's a function that actually has state. Right? How do you implement this function? If you were asked to do it, there's a static uh, variable inside of the function. Right? So remember static variables uh, will actually, you can hold, um, static, the value of a static variable keeps its value between calls um, in a function. Right. Uh, so that's how um, strtok works. Right. Now, when do you want to do this sort of thing? So it turns out you want to do this thing a lot if you work with text files. Right. So tokenization is a very common task when you're uh, dealing with uh, data that's exchanged as text. Right. So Power, uh, sorry, Excel. Right. So Microsoft Excel, it has its own very convoluted. Um, file format, right? So when you get a .xslx file, it's got some very strange non-standard, well, technically it's standardized, but no one actually knows what the standard is, um, format for its data, right? Instead of using an, uh, an Excel native file, you can pass around what's called a comma-separated value file, right? So in a CSV file, um, everything is just information separated with commas. Right? So pretty much every spreadsheet program that's out there can read a comma-separated value file. Right? Uh, database, uh, database programs often will use what's called tab-separated values instead. Right? So instead of commas, they use the tab character to separate information. Right? Uh, all right, so if you need to read one of these formatted files, um, then you need to know how to read a file, right? Uh, so in other words, you need to know about input and output. Uh, we've, done input uh, we've done input from the command line already, right? We've done output to the standard out already, right? Uh, but if you want to read from a file, that's a little bit uh, more involved. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. I just, let me just skip ahead here for a second, okay. Uh, so instead of dealing with the very low-level details of transferring information between hardware devices, right? So instead of making you figure out how do you read data uh, information from a hard drive or from a network socket, right? Or from a USB key or whatever else, right? Uh, C provides you with an abstraction of information, right? Of how information flows uh, as input and output. Um, so the one that we're going to talk, we're not going to talk about the very low level one. There's a low level library, there's a higher level one. So we're going to talk about the higher level library. 
So a stream of data you can think of as simply being a source or a sink of characters or bytes. Right? So characters would be a text-based stream. Right? So in other words, you can think of a string as just being a source of characters. Right? So the file data structure that represents a stream of information in C is called a file, capital F-I-L-E. Right? Uh, it's actually defined as a struct, right? What's in the struct, I don't know, but uh, a file struct stores all of the information needed to control an I.O. stream, right? Uh, I don't know, and in fact, it's not easy to get that information. You actually have to look at how the compiler, uh, how the compiler writers have implemented the file data structure, right? So it stores a whole bunch of information related to uh, controlling a stream. Is this going to work? Oh, sorry, hang on. Uh, so there, here's the documentation page for it. Um, those 10 things, uh, so that's the, doo -doo -doo -doo, that's the, that's not complete, that's not the complete list of stuff that's stored in a file struct, right? So besides the system specific information necessary to access the device, each file uh, structure holds the following information. Right, so there's a bunch of stuff here. Sorry. Mm. Uh, so there's a bunch of information here. Normally, you don't need to access this information. I don't think there's any way to get to it either. Um, okay, so when you use this file, this thing called file, right? Uh, you have to be careful when you use it, right? So file objects are allocated and managed internally by the input-output library functions, right? Don't try to create your own objects of type file, right? So in other words, don't write file f, right, equals something, right? Or don't write file f in general, right? So don't try to make your own file objects. Let the libraries do it, the, uh, let the libraries do it. So your programs should deal only with pointers to these objects, right? So when you write a program that's using, uh, that's gonna read or write to a file, you're always working with pointers to these things, right? So in other words, always use file star as your variable type. Okay, so when your main function of a program runs, um, it has three open streams for you ready to use. Right, so if you remember way back to the beginning of the course when we talked about streams and bash, right, there's a standard in, there's a standard out, there's a standard error, right? So in C, there's a standard in, there's a standard out, and there's a standard error, right? So you get these three streams uh, defined for you automatically um, from the header file standard io.h, right? So uh, this says when the main, pro main function of a program runs with a star. Right, so this is only true if uh, your program is running on a computer that actually does input or output. Right, so in other words, if there's a monitor, if there, if it's possible to hook up a monitor or something to this device, to the computer. Uh, in, but I guess in general, I.O. operations are often buffered. So what does that mean? It means that uh, data is stored internally somewhere in an array, right? When the buffer is full, or we say flushed, right? Then the contents of the buffer are transferred, right? Uh, and streams might have their own buffers. So you have to be, so when you read something from a stream, right, you may not have the results immediately available to you when you actually read the stream. Similarly, when you write to a stream, right, so when I write to a file, right, the contents of the file may not be updated immediately after you call the function that writes to the file. Right, so the, the information might go into a buffer somewhere and then some time might pass before that buffer, act, the contents of the buffer get written or uh, read. Right. So streams can be in one of three states, right? They can be unbuffered. Uh, so unbuffered stream means that data is transferred as soon as it appears on the buffer, right? Standard error might be unbuffered, right? So error messages tend, uh, I think in Linux, standard error is unbuffered. So if you write something to standard error, it appears immediately on standard error, right? In other words, it does not wait until the buffer is full before an error message is printed. It can be fully buffered, 
right? So data is transferred only when the buffer is full, right? So that's the normal uh, behavior of standard in and standard out on Linux, right? And then it can be, actually that's not true, sorry. Uh, that's not true. Uh, standard in and standard out is line buffered. So in a line buffered uh, stream, data is transferred as lines, right? So whenever you see a new line character, that's when this stream um, is written or uh, is either read or written to. Right? So standard in and standard out uh, are usually line buffered if they're connected to a terminal. Right? So in other words, if you print something to standard out, but you don't include the slash n, right? so in other words, you don't print the new line, it may not appear on standard out until you either print a sla uh, the new line character or you flush the buffer. Right? Similarly, if you try to read something from standard in, Right? and you don't read the, uh, the uh, new line character, um, it may not appear on your, um, in your buffer until you actually read the new line. Okay, so when you create a stream, uh, you, if you're gonna create a stream to read a file, then you have to open the stream first. Right? So when you open a stream, you can be using the stream for different things. Right? So you can read a stream, so that's what, uh, if you wanna read a file, you'd open it for reading. Right? If you wanted to op uh, open a file and write to it, you would open it in write mode. Right? Then there's append, there's read extended, write extended, and append extended. Okay? So what does read do? Read opens a file for reading. W creates a file for writing. And A will open a file so that you can append to the file. Right? They all do slightly different things depending on whether or not the file exists or not. Right? So if you try to read a file that exists, it starts reading from the start of the file. If the file doesn't exist, then the open uh, function will fail. You have to be careful with write. Right? So if you open a file for writing and the file already exists, then uh, write will destroy the contents of the file. Right? If the file doesn't exist, it makes a new file for you. Right? Append will write to the end of the file if the file exists. Right? And it makes a new file for you if it doesn't exist. Okay, so opening a file allocates system, res oops, sorry, allocates system resources. Right? So whenever you, um, the file that you, where's the function that, oh, here it is. Sorry, I skipped the file, a, sl a slide. Uh, so before you can use a stream, it has to be opened. Right? Now standard in, standard out, standard error are already opened for you. Right? So to open a stream, you use the function called fopen, right? fopen returns a pointer to a file struct, right? Uh, so you pass in the file name and the name that you want to open. You pass in the mode that you want to open the file with, right? If this thing can't open the file for whatever reason, it returns null, right? Okay, so when you open a file, that actually allocates uh, resources from the operating system. Right? So if you have a loop and you constantly open up a file inside the loop, eventually the operating system will run out of resources uh, to let you open the file. Right? So in other words, you can no longer open up any other files. And that's not just you, it means the operating system can no longer open up any other files. Right? So it's important that when, you, uh, when you're done with a file, you close it. Right? So F close will close the stream. Right? When you close a stream, if there's still information sitting in the buffer, it will write the, any uh, contents, any unwritten contents, um, it will be, will be delivered to the operating system so that the rest of the buffer can be written, right? If you've got an input stream and you close the input stream and there's stuff sitting in the buffer, the information's lost, right? It just disappears. Uh, Fclose can fail, which seems strange, right? Why, why, can, why does closing of a stream how can it possibly fail, right? Um, it can happen. Uh, normally that indicates something strange has happened on your computing system, right? So you normally can't do anything about it anyway, right? So even though fclose returns an int, uh, it's common to simply not look at the return value, right? Because you can't do anything about it anyway. Uh, but, 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 even if fclose fail, even if fclose fails, Right? The stream is no longer associated with the file after calling it. Right? Uh, so you, in other words, the resources are returned back to the operating system. 
All right, so suppose you have a stream that's open, right? So I open up a file and I want to read it, right? How do you read the file? There's a bunch of different ways you can read the file, right? You can read it character by character. You can read it line by line. Uh, you can try to read in individual strings, individual numbers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's lots and lots of different ways that you can read information from a file. Sorry, word. Okay, so let's do, wait, what happened? Searching, wrong slide, right? Yes, wrong slide, okay. No, hang on, what happened? Strings here. This one, right? Wait, what? What's going on? Sorry. Okay, so if you want to read a file character by character, then you can use the function fgetc. Right? So fgetc reads a character from the file pointed at by that uh, pointer there. Right? So it tries to read in one character, right? exactly one character from the input stream, uh, returns the character as an unsigned car converted to int. Again, for historical reasons. Right? Because historically it was common to represent cars as ints, even though we have a car type. Right. If it can't read the string, it returns this EOF value uh, on failure. Right. So if it can't read the stream for some reason, it might be closed, the file might not, uh, may no longer exist, lots of reasons why it might not work. Right. You end up with a, uh, you have to look at the error, um, the return value. Right. So here's a little program that opens up the file called temp.txt. Right. So we open up the file, right. passing in the file name, and the open mode, so R means read. Right? If that pointer is null, right, that means temp.txt couldn't be opened for reading. Right? Now why might that happen? Temp.txt might not exist. Right? It might not be a regular file. It might not be readable. Right? Uh, so there's lots of reasons why um, this might fail. Right? Otherwise, I'm gonna try to read the character, uh, the file character by character. So I need somewhere to store the character, so I'm gonna create a little variable called C, right? I'm gonna call fgetc, right? And store the value in C, uh, in the variable C, right? Now remember, this is a, a little unusual, right? So I have an assignment, and then I'm gonna check the result of the assignment, right? It's important that this pair of parentheses be here, right? It's important because assignment has uh, lower precedence than not equals, right? So if you wrote C equals F get C not equal to EOF, then what happens is F get, uh, F get C F runs, then you compare the result to EOF, right? That's either true or false. So it's zero or one, and then the zero or one gets stored in C, and that's not what you want, right? I wanna store whatever F get C returns in C, and then compare C to EOF. Right, so that pair of parentheses is important. Right. So if C is not EOF, that means F get C uh, read a character, so I can print the character C. Right. So put cars like puts. Right. Puts prints a string, put puts a character. Right. Uh, hopefully I have this program here somewhere. Uh, read file, read, is there a read car? Can't read. Do, 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 do. Is this one? Yes, this one does it. Is there a temp.txt? Okay, so let's see what temp.txt is. Okay, so temp.txt is just the string there. Right, so if I read this thing character by character. Oh, that's fascinating. Read file, what happened? Read file. Um, sorry. Code. Did I do something funny? Do, do. I did not. Read file dot C. Sorry. Right. Oh, there we go. Okay, so it just wasn't compiled properly. Right, so when you uh, print it out, uh, so uh, that's an example of reading a file character by character. 
Now, if you want to read in line by line, you can do that too. And I guess we'll look at that in the next class. Uh, and then we'll also show you how to read in things, um, I guess, value by value is the best way to put it. Right, so for example, if you've got a file that contains numbers or something like that, there is a way to read in just the numbers. Right? Or there's a way to read in numbers. Um, numbers, strings, individual characters, and so on and so forth. Right? So we'll look at that in the next class. Um, and I guess we'll end that uh, one we'll there today. Any assignment questions? Okay. I did get some weird ones by email, so I just wanted to check with people who are here. Although I suspect the people that are here probably aren't having too many problems with the assignments. <laughs>